Okay, recording is on. Welcome back to the second lecture of RBC 310 for class. Um, any questions on just communication? I know it's a very simple topic, nothing complicated, uh, but from the context of church and Christian ministry, any questions on that before we move forward? Okay, Jeffina, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people use uh, the issues that happening in the church congregation in their sermons, uh, and uh, I've heard I heard preachings like that, and they feel it's a good example because the church knows it, the church people have seen it. But then is I don't feel it's actually right to use a person's name or what a person did uh, in a sermon. But uh, I just want to know, is it right or is it wrong? Uh, very good question. So the question is, in, in our preaching on Sunday, not preaching or you know, in Sunday services or other public, um, uh, public uh, you know, settings, can we, or you know, is it right to use uh, examples of in the names of people, uh, incidents, things that are happening or have happened as part of the sermon? Now, one is I never do it. I feel it's wrong uh, to use. Uh, I, I, let me let me qualify that. Uh, in general, I don't do it. You know, so that means. Uh, especially when it's a you know a, di a, a difficult situation, right? so I would never mention a person's a person's name, uh, meaning pe people whom we know. It's okay if you're talking about some historical figure or you know some Bible character. Obviously, somebody in the congregation, somebody was there. Uh, I wouldn't use that person's name. I wouldn't necessarily talk about that situation in as yes, part of the sermon. So never do that. The only time you would mention a person's name is if you want to celebrate that person. Oh, you know, John did such a wonderful job. He went on a mission trip. Uh, you know, he he preached to so many people. If you want to celebrate a person, yeah, do it publicly. Right? Do, and if you really want to, okay, that is a good thing, right? So yes, if, if you want to celebrate somebody, celebrate their, you know, their something good they did, yeah, you can mention that, but never. Uh, to correct, to put people down, to expose uh, difficult situations, never do that. You know? So that's something. Uh, so those kinds of matters have to be done, dealt with privately, one on one. Right now, what does the Bible say in First Timothy chapter five? Uh, the Apostle Paul writes. He says, uh, "Do not receive an accusation against an elder." Except in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let me just uh, give you the example. First, yeah, first of all, chapter 5, yeah, uh, verse 19, 20, 21. Uh, so he says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder. Uh, so, the, you know, the, unless there are two or three witnesses. And then he says, He says, Those who are sinning, rebuke before all, that others may learn and be. Correct. So, if especially like an elder, or somebody in position of leadership, if they are doing something wrong, first thing is uh, I must deal with it privately. Right? Uh, if there's an accusation, something wrong, I deal with it privately. Make sure that there are you know valid witnesses, you know, actual genuine things. But if that person is continuing to sin. If that person is continuing to do something wrong, then I have to bring the matter in. This is those who are continuing to sin, rebuke before all. But who is he talking about? He's talking about the elders. He's not talking about every church member. <laughs> so we, we can't just simply say, oh, that person is doing wrong, this person, and talk about it in public to everybody. Right? That's not the thing. The context is okay, if there's a person who's in spiritual leadership, who is uh, 
who is doing something wrong, deal with it privately. Make sure that you know there are two or three witnesses, that the case is genuine, you deal with it privately. But if that person is continuing to sin, because that person is in leadership and their continuing wrongdoing, even after correction, is going to affect the community. Okay? So in that case, he says you address it publicly. So in the last you know, example, I would say uh, in the last 23 years of pastoring this church, APC, I think only once I've had, or uh, only once I've had to deal, address a matter publicly. But that was to explain a decision we made in the, uh, about what. Otherwise, uh, we don't. So, uh, we deal with it privately. You know, then we don't mention those things. Now, of course, it, 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 the things that we do publicly are when we are appointing a new pastor or we are releasing a new pastor. Those things, you know, actually this coming Sunday, one of our pastors is uh, moving abroad. So, yeah, we will do it publicly. We'll call him on stage. We'll announce him. We'll thank him. Uh, we'll say, okay, he has served so many years. We are blessing him. He's moving abroad. Okay. So that those kind of things we do publicly. Yeah, but then welcoming a new pastor, releasing the pastor. Um, or any transition, important transition that's happening. Yeah, those we do publicly. Uh, if you want to celebrate somebody, we do it publicly. But we never criticize, condemn, judge individuals or congregants. We don't do it because it's very hurtful for people. You know, when we, when we, do those kinds of things. It hurts people, so it shouldn't do it. Um, Pastor, just uh, a follow up question for that. Sure. Uh, let's say um, uh, we've had uh, uh, comments from people, or let's say uh, there had been a discussion regarding some matters, and uh, is it uh, do we address the matter in sermon, not mentioning the name of the people? Let's say, for example, one ex I'll mention two examples. One, uh, imagine a person has given uh, an interview to church and he did not qualify. And uh, the next time when we talk about excellence and um, uh, you know the importance of being excellent and you know not uh, not able to crack the interview, would that person get hurt? Or you know that is not we are not mentioning about that person, but what if they try to connect with their incidents and things like that? Another example is. Um, this I mean recently happened. Like, you know, some people ask about giving holy communion to people who are not baptized. And when the next time when any such kind of sermon comes, when we mention it, would that people get hurt? I mean, we are not mentioning any name, but if mm. we address the the question, uh, would that people get hurt? Yeah. So yeah. So um, what we need to do is just. Uh, you know, kind of use a little bit of wisdom. So, if an uh, example like this, right? Uh, let's take the first example. If there is a matter, uh, so, so, you know, like somebody interviewed, they didn't they get in, but let's say the next Sunday you're talking about excellence or something. I think uh, how we communicate it can be, we just communicate it saying, you know, for all of us in all areas of life, in you know in every kind of workplace you know ex people do expect excellence so that means we you know because in our minds it's very clear that i'm talking about excellence but i'm not talking about that particular incident for us those two things are very separate uh, but we are also aware that there's somebody sitting in the congregation who might have a tendency to make that connection which is not we never intended it for that. So we can be a little extra cautious in how we communicate that particular point in the sermon. If it's happening, you know, in, 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 a, in close proximity to that incident and it's part of the message, you you know, you happen to be speaking like, it's okay. So just give it a little extra separation, you know, from that incident. Uh, that means what you're doing is you're being conscious that you don't want that individual or those individuals uh, to think that, even think that you're connecting these two things, which because you're very clear, you are not. 
So you just, you know, say, okay, you know, you're making it very broad. You're saying it's not just in church setting, but in any situation where we are working, we're serving, uh, we do want to pursue excellence. The other, other case, when you're talking about communion, I think uh, we need to say what we need to say that is, okay, this is, you know, this is how we practice Holy Communion. And uh, you can be, you know, uh, you can do it again uh, in, a, in a way that, I mean, if, if people do the connection, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not intentional that they make the connection. They just leave it, you know, it's, it's up to them to resolve it. It's not that we are intentionally doing it. You know, so our, our conscience is clear, our mind is clear, and we're going to present it in a way that is separate from that particular question. On that particular incident, uh, so I think uh, we should not be, you know, we, we don't need to fear that they might make a connection, but we can be wise. That means we can try to present it as distant from that particular incident and communicate it in that way. I hope that helps. Yes, boss. Yes, thank you. Now, in some cases, I don't even bring it up. You know, for example, I tell you one one difficult situation and this happened many years ago i can i forget which year but uh, so we had started uh, our campus in south apc south campus we had started it we were still small at that time so and i would say the congregation may have been just 20 30 something like that so you're still small and we had, uh, we had uh, the congregations there uh, in, 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 in South uh, Bangalore. Now, what happened was one Friday evening in our prayer meeting, uh, two men came. Uh, they met me after prayer. They said, uh, oh, we heard that you have a campus in the south of the city, uh, church there. And I said, yeah. And they said, oh, we, these two men, uh, brothers, uh, they, they said, oh, we want to start a ministry in the south. I said, yeah, good. We need more churches in the south, you know, uh, and, uh, because that seems to be a big unreached part of our city. So that's great. And uh, um, then uh, they said, yeah, we want to do healing services. I said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, you know, I, I, I just wanted to show some support. So I said, uh, you know, if you go and start a church in the south of our city, uh, we as APC, we will contribute 50,000 rupees to help you start. It's our gift to you. We will give that to you to help you start a church, uh, a ministry. So I made that commitment, the verbal commitment, uh, saying we will help you. And these are like two people. I mean, I never met them really before this. Uh, they just came. They were talking as believers. And, yeah, go ahead. Sir. Then they said, um, we want to start. Actually, when they told me, first they didn't tell them on sort of church. They said, we want to start a prayer meeting. I said, go ahead for it. They said, then they said, we want to start a healing service. And I said, go ahead and do it. Then they said, we want to start a church. I said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And I made the commitment, you know, uh, we will help you when you 50,000 rupees will give you. And this was many years ago. So at that time, 50,000 rupees was a good amount uh, to help them get started. And that's it. We prayed, we went. After maybe two weeks, after that meeting, I got away information from other church people, people who were, you know, we had, we had, we, our congregation was still very small. We had just, you know, in, in the early stages. And uh, you get information from people saying, hey, there were these two pastors, they're visiting all our churches, and they're coming to our people's homes, they're giving them prophecies, and they're telling them, see, your pastor doesn't even come and visit you in your house. Um, of course, I, I, I was not visiting people's home office, you know, I, that is very far away and all those things. And, and they were telling people, you know, remove this thing from your house and take it out. And there was so much of confusion. And so at least two families, at least two, and I, and I don't know about the details, but at least two families called me and said, hey, this is happening. How do we, what should we do? And I was so disturbed because... These two people came and told me they're going to start a church. I, I, I didn't expect them to go and disturb our church people, right? I thought they were going to go and start the church, do a new work. And I already promised to help them. But now 
the news I'm getting is they are disturbing people in our own congregation and they're, they're saying these kinds of bad things. They're putting doubts and all of that. And I was like, oh God, what am I supposed to do? You know, it really disturbed me. And but here's how I how I handled it. So for quite a few weeks, I was struggling with this, but I said, I'm not going to speak about this from the pulpit. I will not mention their names. I will not talk about them. I will not talk about this matter from the pulpit. I will just minister God's word, just minister to the congregation, be quiet. And it was difficult, you know, because I knew there were two or three families in the congregation who were being visited by these people, disturbed by these people. But I said, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want to give, in my mind, I was saying, I don't want to give devil pulpit tech. He's not worthy of pulpit tech. I'm not going to give the devil any time on the pulpit. I'm not going to, you know, this is a disturbing thing, but I'm not going to give the devil pulpit tech. This pulpit tech is sacred. I'm just going to speak God's word, bless the people born. And I didn't know how to handle it yet. So I was just saying, oh God, what do I do? How do I handle this situation? But I remember that um, these two people, when they came, they had used the reference of another senior pastor in the church, in the city. So what I did was I called that senior pastor. He was a good friend of mine. So I called him. I said, uh, Pastor, the, the, these two people, they came, they gave your, they mentioned your name. They said they came from your church. Uh, they, uh, you know, I just gave a little background. I'm going to ask, do you know them? I mean, what, what do you have to say? Then he told me, he said, oh, they're, they're, like, they're causing a lot of trouble. They caused trouble here and now they've gone out. And then mentioned the name of another pastor. So I also called that person and asked him, you know, these people have said this, this, what actually happened. So he also gave me an update. Then I knew that these people were actually causing trouble. Right? So the only action I took was I informed them that I will not, because that they have caused this trouble, and they're causing this trouble, which is not right, I will not be giving the money that I promised. So I've been through that. I said, see, uh, I didn't expect you to go and trouble our own church people. I expected you to go and start a new church, and I was willing to help you do that. But this is what you've done. You've gone and you're disturbing people in the existing church. That's not right. And so I'm going to go back on my word. I'm not going to give that money that I promised to you. Uh, so please excuse me from it. That's the action I took directly with them. Right? I did not say anything to the congregation. I didn't discuss this matter with uh, you know the people, the individual families who complained to me who reached out to me. I just say, uh, you know, just you just stay firm in, in church and continue growing. That's it. I remember one Sunday. Uh, towards you know, while all this was going on on Sunday morning, uh, in my mind, I was saying, God, why is this happening? What is the real cause behind all this? Why is this happening? I remember that Sunday morning, while I was in South on the campus, there, I was coming forward to pray. The worship I just got over, I was coming forward to pray, and suddenly in my spirit, God dropped the words divine order. And the message that came to me was. Whenever we violate divine order in the church, we cause confusion, we cause this kind of problem. I received that in my spirit. Then I went back to the New Testament. I said, okay, God is saying something about divine order. And I started searching. I said, hey, is there anything about divine order in the New Testament? You know? And then I saw Paul in the, to the Corinthian church. To Titus, uh, and even in the book of Revelation, Paul mentions, he says, I, I, when I come, I will set things in order to the Corinthian church. To Titus, he says, Titus, uh, I want you to set things in order among the churches in Crete. Oh, so then, and, and, and then I understood there is thing, something called divine order. That, that means there is a way in which as churches, we should function. And when we violate divine order, uh, you know, we cause a disturbance in the body of Christ. And that's how the book, you know, I wrote a book out of that called Divine Order. 
So that book came out of that whole journey of struggling. But the so I learned through that. But the thing the thing that I resolved to do was I will not talk about this from the pulpit because I don't want to talk bad about these people. I don't want to mention their names. I don't want to speak bad about them. I handled it privately, and uh, everything went smooth. And, and I learned. I received a revelation through that difficult experience about the divine order, and uh, you know, I learned from it. So, so that's an example where there was something disturbing going on. The congregation was disturbed, but it was uh, a resolve not to address it in public from the pulpit. Just handle it privately and keep focused on doing what God wants us to do. And then eventually it all everything subsided. And, uh, they, those two people, they left that place. They really did not even start a church. Within a couple of weeks, they left. And I don't know what happened after that. You know? So yeah, that's just an experience. Oh, but so just one more question regarding communication. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's say uh, two uh, individuals among the congregation, if they have a misunderstanding and one person lets us know, um, do we interfere or not? Or how do we stand in that place? Mm. Yeah. So I think uh, our our first step is try to see if they can solve it amongst themselves. That's the best, right? So, so somebody comes to you and says, hey, this is happening between us and there's a problem. Then we can advise this person saying, hey, try to you know to apply the principles of the Bible and both of you try to peacefully resolve the matter. If you cannot, then you, you know, both of you can come and meet me and I can help you intervene. So the first step is to see if they can resolve it between themselves. If they cannot, then it's good that both come and as a, as a pastor or if you need, you know, a, a leadership team to be involved. This is Matthew chapter 18, right? Where uh, Jesus said, if you have anything against a brother, you go and try to go and tell him, and we, you know, settle, settle the matter with him. If that you cannot settle it, then you take it to the elders of the church. So we're following the Matthew 18 principle. And we try to resolve it there. And whatever is decided, they have to follow. If they don't follow, then the person who's not following, you know, uh, is answerable to God. And Matthew 18 actually says, okay, you. Uh, you know, to kind of send them out of the fellowship. So I think it all depends on the seriousness of it and what the matter is. But I think step one, let them try to resolve it by themselves. If that doesn't happen, then let them bring it to the elders of the church, according to Matthew 18. Um, and I remember one serious example, serious case that happened in our church, which was uh, here in Bangalore was uh, about two businesses, you know. So there are two people, they're both part of the congregation, they're both having their own businesses, but they were working with each other. And then there was conflict. Now, these are two brothers, like, you know, people, believers in the same church. They have their own businesses. They were doing something together, and then there was conflict. And it, 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 it escalated. It, uh, uh, I think it even, how far did it go? I can't remember now. I think there was some police complaints. There was some legal issues. So it kind of really went. And this is between two people. And so finally, they reached out to me. And then I said, OK, you know, this, the Bible tells us to do this. I know it's a big issue. This was involves money. It involves business. Uh, it's gotten into some complications. I know it's there, but let's see if we can sit, sit down and resolve it. So both the CEOs came uh, and we sat in the church office. Uh, they came with all their information. 
And uh, we did what Matthew 18 told us to do. No? So we listened to one side, listened to the other. Uh, and this was, of course, a business matter. So there was a lot of money involved and all of those things. And then we said, okay, our goal is to resolve this matter peacefully. And just to you know, sum it up, one party had to repay. I mean, there was some you know, mishandling of things or so on. So we said, okay, this party has to repay so much amount. This person was willing to forgive a certain amount. This party should repay. How can there be? We established a payment plan and we said, okay, this is how you're going to repay. This is the schedule. This is how you're going to repay. Let us settle the matter here. And that's it. Okay. So um, that's how we handled it. And it worked out fine. Meaning, I'm not saying they became friends or anything. <laughs> the matter was resolved. Now, it would have been nice if the relationship also was healed, but that did not happen. Uh, at least the matter was thing and it didn't escalate into some legal fight and all that. Uh, the matter was resolved, whatever was had to be paid was settled. Uh, I, I held them accountable. I said, you know, you have to send me an email to show that this thing has happened. So that was clear, but the relationship, you know, uh, is something we cannot force. And uh, to my knowledge, they went their separate ways, which, you know, that is a decision they made. So to answer your question, you know, we follow Matthew 18 principle and do our best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Give us. Anything else on communication? <laughs> Interesting questions. I didn't expect um, all these questions. but. Okay, let's go forward. So now we change our focus to culture. Culture, lesson number 10. Um, so we talk here, we want to focus on the organizational culture, the culture of the church as an organization. So, you know, we can look at it as um, the culture of the church as a community, that is the culture of the congregation. Or we can look at the culture of the organization. Right? So now we are looking at the culture of the organization. That, the, so uh, we are talking about the ministry administration, the administration part. And so we want to talk about the culture of the organization. That means we have to be careful to maintain a good working culture in the organization. And, uh, you know, um, time and time again, we will read, uh, you know, if you look at Christianity Today, the uh, Christian magazine online, online Christian magazine, uh, it, it, it happens at a, almost like every year there will be some report of abuse inside a big Christian organization, you know, uh, people were not treated properly. And it, it, sometimes it surprises us, you know, you think like, okay, such a big Christian organization, sometimes a big Christian church. Uh, 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 but inside the organization where people are working, people are serving, doing ministry, they're actually experiencing abuse. They're ex experiencing hurt. And, uh, you know, when it comes out in the news, it's very shocking that uh, we would think that, hey, a Christian ministry must be having a very healthy, you know, joyful, compassionate culture where people can be very happy doing serving God and doing ministry. But when this kind of, uh, you know, uh, when this kind of news comes out, whether it's a Christian ministry or a Christian church. And then we realize that this doesn't happen automatically. We have to guard and we have to intentionally create the right kind of culture within the organization. Otherwise, people can get hurt and people can, you know, it, it can be very bad. 
it's even inside a Christian ministry or a Christian organization, right? So we need to talk about this. We need to be careful to maintain the right kind of culture, work culture uh, within the organization. So that's what we will talk about in this lesson, right? So when you talk about culture, basically we're talking about, you know, common values, common practices, how we all work together, how we all relate with each other. So it can be described through jointly held beliefs. That means we all believe uh, certain things. There are values and uh, practices that we commonly follow. Uh, we have certain ways of behavior and thinking. Uh, we all seem to you know, follow that. We have certain way of doing things, how we do it. So these are things that actually shape our culture, the culture within an organization. And so even in, within the Christian ministry or within the church organization, we have to be careful about these things. So for example, example, let us give you an example. We all hold the common belief that we need to honor and respect one another. We also hold the common belief that we need to honor and respect our leaders. And these are biblical things. But if that belief that we have to respect our leaders is taken too far to the point where, example, we put our leaders on a pedestal. That creates an unhealthy culture. See, God told us, you know, you, you respect those who labor among you. Yeah. But he didn't say put them on a pedestal. So you respect them, you honor them, but don't make them like you know, next in line after God. Right? Or if my honor and respect for leadership puts me in a place where I'm being misused or abused by the leadership, then that's an unhealthy culture. So here's an example where a belief, a jointly held belief, especially in the Christian context where the Bible is teaching us, you know, honor those who labor among you, honor your those who minister to you, the word and doctrine. So the Bible states you honor, respect them. Yes, it's a, it's a commonly held belief. We all have that same belief. It's part of our culture. But if it is taken out of context, where either I'm putting the leader on a pedestal or the lead, I'm allowing the leader, because I'm honoring the leader, the leader is abusing me, that's a danger. Right? That's a misplaced part of the culture but sadly and, and, and like this we can look at many examples where a commonly held belief or a practice or a way of thinking or way things are done if they're not kept in the right place it can actually lead to a very toxic culture a culture where uh, people can be hurt People can be abused, uh, and the culture becomes very toxic. It's unhealthy, right? So our beliefs, our practices, our way of thinking should be kept in in the right place. That's very important. That's how we can maintain a healthy culture. So uh, in a large organization, we need to understand that there could be subcultures. That means there's an organizational culture, but locally within various groups, the culture could be a little different. Um, the dynamic of the culture could change over time uh, due to external internal changes. Um, and what we are after is that the culture of the Christian organization and the culture of the congregation, we want to have a true, genuine, Christian, godly, kingdom culture. So that's what we should be watching about, care, caring about and working towards.
So why is culture important when you talk about it within an organization? Why is it important? Because it affects all the employees and it affects the employees' experience. You know, working in the church, you know, how do they feel happy? Uh, do they are they able to do their best? Are they do they feel valued? Uh, it affects their outcome uh, to some degree, of course. Uh, productivity depends on their skills and knowledge and all that. But culture also influences their productivity. You know, if it's a healthy culture, people feel more energized to serve them. Uh, uh, it also affects how the congregation is served. If the staff are very happy, they will, they will cheerfully serve the congregation. Uh, and it also protects the organization from negative influences. So the culture is like the organization system. If we have a good, healthy culture, if bad ideas try to come in, it will automatically protect the organization. So no, 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 this is our culture. This is how we do things. We will not entertain that negative idea, the negative influence in our culture. Right? So it's very important that we create a good culture in the organization, and of course, also in the congregation. Uh, so the principles we learned today uh, will apply to both. Let me just cover one more point, and then we will pause for today. So. Our next question is, what shapes the culture? You know, how does this culture shape? And um, in, 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 in a lot of uh, research and writing about culture, one of the things that you will find is that leadership, culture starts with the leadership. Right? That means it, 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 it actually goes top down. Because if whatever the leaders model, people will tend to follow. So this is one thing that doesn't go bottom up. You know, it's one. It's one thing that comes top down. So the leader or the leadership, to a large extent, they influence and they shape the culture in their organization or in their sphere of influence. You know? So people are watching, you know, whether it's a main leader or it's the leader of the team or leader of the ministry, people are going to be influenced by whoever is the, the leader there. Yeah. So leadership is very important. So how, how, how does leadership matter? The leadership, the leadership's behavior must be always consistent to the culture that we want to produce, the values that we want in the organization. So if the leaders at all levels, starting from the top, and the leader at every level, they model, they embody the value, the cult values that we want to see in the culture, then people begin to reproduce them they begin to see the same thing. So uh, we must uh, re be reproduced of our own kind. So example, if the leader behaves like a celebrity, example, yeah, if the leader behaves like a celebrity, what happens? We create a celebrity culture. You know? So everybody thinks this is how we have to treat the leader and it's become a celebrity mindset. Then what will happen is if there are junior leaders, the junior leaders also behave like celebrities. They expect the same kind from those who are under them. So we create a celebrity culture. Uh, we begin to put people on pedestal and you know, all the, 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 the negative things that come. Uh, from a celebrity culture, especially if you're having it in a church context, you're having it in a ministry context, it's very unhealthy. Maybe a celebrity culture will pass when, you know, in the entertainment industry or the music industry or something, but in the church, you know, uh, that's not part of kingdom culture. It's not part of church culture. In the church, 
Jesus has taught us to be servants. And he said, whoever wants to be a leader, let him be a servant. That's the model Jesus set for the church. Right? So celebrity culture in the church or in Christian ministry, it is an anomaly. It is something wrong. It is unacceptable because it's not something the Bible embraces. Uh, the, 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 the kind of leadership is about servant leaders. So the leader has to embody that. If the leader walks as a servant, then all the other leaders will also walk as a servant, as servants. And you will create a culture where people are ready to serve. They don't mind doing anything. Because the leader models it, everybody will follow that. So that's the first thing you must understand. In an organization, culture comes top down. It starts with the leaders. And whatever the leaders embody, that's what is going to become part of the culture. And so uh, as leaders, we have to very consciously think, what is the culture I want to have in the organization? It starts with me. I have to embody that. I have to model it. Then I can create that culture in the organization. So we'll pause here. Uh, we will talk more about this next week because it's a very important part uh, of church and ministry. And uh, if we get this wrong, then uh, the organization suffers, people in the organization suffer. So we need to really understand this well. Any questions before we close or any comments? Anybody wants to say anything? Okay. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for your patient listening. I hope all of these things are useful for the work and the ministry each of us are doing. But someday, please close in prayer. We'll dismiss. Lord, we want to thank you for this uh, morning. Thank you for the word that we received, oh God. We pray, oh God, that our communication and our culture would be according to kingdom standard and we would be able to bring uh, your truths to people and also in our way of communication help us to be models of god and we ask that uh, help us to see your kingdom being established in our places lord we give you praise in jesus name we pray amen thank you, amen. Thank you everyone enjoy the rest of your day god bless